Uh, I would like first to uh, thank the organizing committee uh, for inviting me to share this uh, 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 scientific uh, session together with Dr. Ashraf Abdel Basit, Ghada Gad, Magda Badawi, Magid Ashraf, uh, Murad Al Alfi, and Rania Ismail. It's a great pleasure, and we have now the floor ready for Dr. Errol Alden. Count on his uh, credentials. He serves as a president of the IPA, which is the International Pediatric Association. So, uh, practically, he is our president, all of us. Uh, after serving as a chairman and professor of pediatrics of the Uniformed Service University of the Health Science, he joined uh, the American Academy, uh, the staff of the American Academy of Pediatrics, where he was the CEO before being president. Um, Dr. Alden has earned numerous awards and honors. Uh, he worked, uh, he completed his residency at the Medican Army Medical Center and the fellowship in neonatology in the University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, we have the pleasure to have him. Uh, and he's going to present us uh, with a lecture on children in disasters. We'd Thank like you. to know what's the disaster. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about the role of the pediatrician. This will be very closely related to Dr. Hassanoglu's talk last night. Well, in Time Magazine, a few months ago, they talked about the exodus. And this is one of the most common problems facing children in today's world. And this is widely recognized by our leadership, by governments every place, except very few people tend to mention the children. The IPA has a motto, we're for every child everywhere we represent over a billion children being taken care of by over a million pediatricians. And I would like to state that this may be the most pressing, and I think it is the most pressing issue that's approaching us in the pediatric world today. We've heard a lot about normal development. Normal development doesn't happen for these kids that are displaced. Each week, there's at least one disaster somewhere in the world which requires outside assistance, and they can happen anywhere. Currently, 72 countries have an ongoing crisis or emergency. Some of these lead to long-term displacements of large populations. Well, children are especially vulnerable during a disaster. In 2015, 50% of displaced children are uh, displaced persons are children. 75% of the current, current Syrian refugees are women and children. So we think there may be 51.2 million people displaced worldwide. Now the numbers are extraordinarily impressive, but they're even more impressive when you think these displaced persons are not terrorists, they're not soldiers fleeing, these are kids, over 50%. One in four of the world's children live in conflict or disaster-stricken countries. If we had one in four children with any disease, we would be ringing the panic alarms. Nearly 50 million children have been forced from their homes, and the number of child refugees more than doubled between 2005 and 2015, and it's still going up. Well, you heard about this last night, the refugees from Syria. In Turkey, they have the largest numbers, and they're closer to four million children right now. This is an earlier slide. But Iraq, Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, these refugee children are all over the world. Well, 60, 671,000 new refugees have arrived in Cox's Bazar and other sites in Bangladesh. The total count is 862,000, almost a million, 55% of whom of our children, and orphans remain at high risk for child marriage and child labor. 
Don't have to tell this group about emergencies in Egypt, refugees and asylum seekers, uh, literally from all over the world, but Syria, Ethiopia, Somalia, Eritrea, and the Sudan. Well, emergency preparedness is something that we think every country should be involved in. But we have less than one third of the countries that have a appropriate emergency plan. Well, let's go back to what we think is health. In 1948, the World Health Organization's definition of health was a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The 2004 Institute of Medicine's definition of child health, the extent to which children are able or enabled to develop and realize their potential. Over a quarter of the world's children have a marginal area. So what are governments doing about it? Well, how many of you heard, have heard of the Sustainable Development Goals? They have been signed off by every government in the world. And what are the ones that specifically relate to children? There are 17 goals altogether. Specific development goal one, no poverty. Significant development goal number two, zero hungry, hunger. Number three, good health and well-being. Four, quality education. Five, gender equality. 10, reduced inequalities. 16, peace, justice, and strong institution. And 17, partnership for the goals. These include such fundamental things of, as the right to be registered at birth, the right to exist as a person. If you're not registered and you're fleeing a country, a birth may not be registered. These are stateless children, so there are major problems, but the Sustainable Development Goals cover that, and every government has signed off on that. Well, what are the stages of a disaster? There's the acute or emergency phase, the recovery phase, and the rehabilitation or development phase. We know the effects of humanitarian emergencies, but let's go over some of them. Displacement of the population, folks that are forced from their homes. Interruption of the food supply, We've heard about how important nutrition is to the mother, how important it is to the fetus. Uh, lots of problems here when we have pregnant women and children in that first 1,000 days. Lack of food and famine, destruction of healthcare infrastructures and facilities, decline of government authority, disruption in education, spread of disease. With the disruption of education, these children's future are badly compromised. Spread of disease, lack of birth registration that I talked a little bit about already. Well, pediatric impacts during the disaster. Uh, overcrowding leads to diarrheal disease and measles. Poor sanitation and hygiene, diarrheal diseases, cholera, hepatitis A. Broken health system, missed routine services, inability to treat outbreaks. Disposal of dead bodies and human waste, spread of disease, food shortage, malnutrition, and vitamin A deficiency. All the things that we've learned over the many years go by the by as you get to in some of these situations. Well, the crowding and measles. We're seeing measles epidemics in Europe. We're seeing measles epidemics in the United States. Syria had one of the highest immunization rates in, in the world. Uh, so does Egypt, so, some do, some, so do some of the other countries. Well, as we get into measles, requires a 95% vaccine coverage rate. When these children, when we don't know where they are, it's very difficult to have them covered. Case fatality rates are up to 32% seen after disasters. Lower initial coverage rates, as you can see, examples across continents and decades. We also see health workers, diversion and depletion, impact of disasters on routine immunizations, poor access to facilities, destruction of supplies and vaccine, 
and logistics systems interruptions. Well, how is the IPA helping? Well, you heard from Dr. Hassanuglu how what the Turkish Pediatric Society is doing. They essentially have said that the Syrian children are going to be treated like their own children. And one of the things they did was develop a film that talks about everything starts with love. What a great uh, idea to begin to get the population understanding that refugees are a high percentage of children and they need to be taken care of. We need to advocate. Advocate government organization and NGOs to provide these children resources and services unless they need to be healthy in the long and short term. In the United States, when children were separated from their parents at the border, we supported the American Academy of Pediatrics in speaking out strongly against that. We had a statement talking about it. Whoever thought we'd need to have a statement saying don't separate parents and children, my goodness. And then a convening. Pediatricians can't do it by themselves. They need to have the government. We know that the governments have so signed on to the Sustainable Development Goals. They've already committed themselves, but they need to be reminded of this. We know that many of the NGOs, Save the Children and others, are involved. So how do we begin to get everybody working together for this very desperate group of children? And that's why we need to have money to convene to begin to get, bring people together in a specific country that are all focused on trying to life, make life better. Uh, we need immunization disaster plans. They need to be developed at the district and national level to ensure immunization coverage and disaster response accounts for disease transmission. And then it needs to be coordinated across stakeholders and partners so we can take advantage of the integrated approach. Unaccompanied minors are a particular problem. They're the most vulnerable children, and they, they consist of infants, children, and adolescents who are without any parent or adult guardian, secondary to a variety of reasons, including death and separation. At the school that Enver mentioned, uh, out of about 600 kids, I think they had over 40 or 50 that were orphans. Uh, huge numbers. A large percentage were missing limbs or hurt, and yet they were all children. So some of the approaches, proactive approaches to unaccompanied minors, provide adult family identification wristbands to keep track, attempt immediate reunification if an unaccompanied minor is identified by finding an adult who knows the child and can take responsibility, document and record detailed information about the separated child and take pictures. We know that psychological support is in very critical. When these children have been through this kind of disasters, they require specialized medical care as well as intense psychological support during the acute emergency phase and later during the recovery and rehabilitation phase of disasters. Children are far more vulnerable than adults. They are dependent on an adult advocate they have limited physical reserves. They're developmentally vulnerable, cognitively and physically. We've heard about that in the nutrition talks earlier. They don't have good judgment, and their abstract reasoning is not there. So what are important recommendations to reduce long-term problems? Predictability and regularity for children. This includes timing of meals, a place for sleeping, same caretakers, and playtimes. When we were at the refugee camps there in Turkey, they were very tightly regimented as far as time and place, and this was very helpful. They also had schools that were available. But remember, this was the refugee camps. They are better immunized than the children out in the general population. And about 70, 80 percent of these children are not in camps. They are scattered throughout the population. The other thing is school is an adult's work, and schools need to be reestablished and routines established as soon as possible. Well, the other aspect is this was drawn by a young man. And home is wherever you feel safe. So it's very important that we have safe places for these children. Again, the Turkish Pediatric Society have written the rise of a hostile 
adolescent population, the Syrian refugee problem. These have been children who have been in the camps or in this situation for over four years. We need to think about how to deal with that, and they're doing that. What needs to be done, the psychological counseling that needs to be done. Research study of 60,000 disaster victims. Uh, there is strong evidence that children are among the most vulnerable population in a disaster, and long-term psychological trauma is uh, likely to, uh, is necessary to avoid life-term problems. So children do vary in their reaction to disasters. And intervention should be developmentally appropriate and also enhance some coping and competencies. Services should be distributed among clinics, schools, and social service areas. The role of the pediatrician disasters preparedness must, we must advocate for the attention to children and government preparedness plans. We work with service delivery points to ensure preparedness plans are developed, communicate the importance of preparedness to families, and serve as experts to guide responses. This includes not only the general pediatrician who may be seeing the children primarily, but it's also important to make sure that these children have access to subspecialists and those are in the pediatric population. So through IPA, specialists from different countries, assess the child's status, help train child health providers, guide pediatric colleagues in disaster areas, and convene pediatricians. We have convened pediatricians from Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon with their Save the Children colleague. One of the things that the IPA can do very well is introduce you to some of the folks who are international in scope to see who's working in the area and how do we pull all these services together. So assess, train, guide, and convene. Industry is also working with that. When they hear the concept of a quarter of the world's children, they are wanting to know how they can help. We approached Johnson & Johnson, for example, because we said, the disasters were happening, what could be done, and we were able to get a grant to begin to help in those three countries that I've mentioned. Uh, Turkey took immediate charge, was working with their government, working with their NGOs, and is doing an excellent job. So there's lots of things that can be done, and if you look at the refugees in Turkey, uh, they are being immunized, they're being educated, they're being trained, so it's great. Uh, for those of you who would like to read about this, it's in February in the journal Pediatrics, and a nice article written by the folks about what they've done and how they've done it. But little things make a huge difference. A psychosocial backpack, Karn Olness, who is head of our disaster relief group, came up with this. For infants and toddlers, books, teddy bears, puppets, art supplies for older children, chapters and books, blank books, etc., drawing supplies. But the IPA is also writing about these issues. And we've had a web-based campaign beginning with letters in September issue of The Lancet, emails to all member societies and 16,000 plus in the IPA database, and we've gotten letters of support received by various individuals and other organizations. We've worked with the nursing organization, uh, FIGO, the OBGYN folks, this isn't a problem that just affects us in pediatrics, it is everybody. We also have the Budapest Declaration on the Rights, Health, and Well-Being of Children and Youth on the move to begin to tell governments what we think needs to be done, the rights and responsibilities for them for those children. Well, this is a picture of several of us at the uh, school there in Istanbul, and you can see these children are getting educated. They look like children do any place. But as we talked to the teachers, uh, it was very interesting. One of the teachers said, when we said, well, what can we do? They said, these children have never been told or taught the usual things of just daily living. They don't know how to brush their teeth. They don't know what to do with a toothbrush. They said, you could really help us with some of those things. Some of the teachers had some of the children with psychological problems. Uh, some of the children had special needs. So with the Pediatric Society, with the dentists and the other people that 
Dr. Asanoglu and his group were able to introduce, we've been able to provide a lot of things for these children. And I bring it to your attention because this sounds like an overwhelming problem, but there's a lot of things we as pediatricians can do, and a lot of these things are absolutely necessary to make life better for these children. Well, I would be available for any questions, and I would ask Dr. Asanoglu if he has anything that he would like to, uh, to add his, from his excellent presentation last night. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask you a question. I think that uh, the policy that Egypt is uh, running over here, it's, uh, it's an excellent uh, review of what's happening all over the world. But in Egypt, uh, the refugees are integrated within the society. They, are not, they don't have a refugee camps as in Turkey or Lebanon or in, uh, Jordan. Over here, uh, the, the pupils or the students are attending the same schools as the Egyptian. So they are feeling that they are living a normal life. They are, in, they are living in our houses. They, are, uh, they, don't, they don't live in camps. The, the problem with the refugee is living in camps, I think so. Uh, if you integrate them in the society, they will be as if uh, they are Egyptians. There is no difference except uh, maybe going to the polls and giving their uh, opinions, but there is no difference they are living with us. They are opening uh, the best uh, restaurants in Egypt. They are doing everything as the Egyptians. So I think this would be uh, a much better way instead of putting them in a refugee camp is to integrate them in the society that they are living. And when they decide, and, uh, and also uh, we must uh, assess also the problem of uh, uh, an occupied land in Palestine, the Palestinian Children are living in an occupied life all their, li all their uh, existing life till now. So these are refugees within their countries. Uh, so we, it's, it's, uh, it's a complex, in, uh, complex situation in uh, the Middle East, uh, whether it's uh, by ourselves or by the others. But uh, we are facing a big problem for our future children. And I think the per best way is what's happening in Egypt is to integrate the refugee in, uh, in the societies that they are living instead of putting them in a camp, yeah. I think so. Well, the vast majority of the children who are displaced, probably 70 or 80 percent, are in the communities. The camps have given it it's a little easier as far as immunization and some of the other aspects, plus some of the schooling. But one of the problems facing the children that are out is language barriers sometimes, cultural differences. There's a whole host of things as you begin to try to integrate them into the society. And in some countries, if there's somebody from Lebanon, it's over a third of the population now is refugees. That, you know, it, it makes it a, a, huge, yeah. Uh, a yeah. huge problem. Uh, I do agree with yourself about, I mean, we don't have non-attended children coming to Egypt, either from Syria or from Sudan, which make a, a difference uh, because the children are coming with their families. Uh, but as you mentioned, in Lebanon, they have more refugees than their Lebanon uh, population, which is and some of the children are not attending with an adult. That's why maybe the children is much more uh, communicate and doing better in Egypt than in other countries. Thanks. Thank you. Well, our plea from the IPA would be to get involved, to see what's going on in your own community. Sometimes the children are there in, in cultures that are not relating well. Uh, to see what your government's doing or not doing, and uh, then to make sure that you're aware of the sustainable development goals and that it is an obligation that the governments have signed off on and just see if they are meeting their responsibility for these children. So thank you very much.